over the span of time, that person is going to take more chances and be more at risk of a disease rather than less. And I think that's basically what we've seen culturally over the last 25 years. And I really want to know because when I went to teach in Boston, the first year that I was there was when clinics um, you know, began giving contraceptives to kids. And this was supposed to be the end of teenage pregnancy. But instead, from 1971 until today, all I've heard year after year is the constant drumbeat of we have a crisis in teenage pregnancy and we have to do more birth control. And so I always call this the, the Vietnam of sexual politics. We keep thinking if we throw money and troops into this particular fight or this particular way of fighting, then we're going to solve the problem. And in fact, we've only made it worse. Not too many people have heard anything like that, Linda. What's the impact on society? Why, why should we care what people do in the uh, privacy of their bedrooms? Sometimes private activity has a public cost. Everything that we do touches everybody else in certain ways. And, you know, there's a certain amount of privacy that people do. I, I would never debate that. But if what people do in private creates a child, and then the family isn't formed, and we have a single mother who needs resources from the rest of us, um, or if the woman decides that she wants to have an abortion and wants the rest of us to pay for it, what she has done in private now demands something of the rest of society. So while in a more literal sense I don't believe in peeking in people's bedrooms, what people do in private impinges on the rest of society because sex generates life. Because sex generates life. You know, there's another aspect of this that people don't think about a lot, um, and that is what happens to young people, and it happens to both boys and girls, who when they're young very naively give themselves sexually to another person and then that person walks away. And there is some data out there that really um, connects teenage depression and rates of suicide with the rise in premarital sexual experimentation. So on a lot of different levels, I think we've missed the boat. Instead of sex education, we should be doing love education for kids. That's why I call my book The Vocation of Love, because this is really asking kids, what does it really mean to love another person? Besides, you know, the, the gush of, you know, you know, romantic desire, um, besides affection, love at its very core is a commitment to the well-being of another person. And in a sexual relationship, because it involves the transmission of life, this becomes a lifelong commitment. There was a very wonderful program called the Art of Loving Well. It was a secular abstinence program. It was developed over at Boston University. And I really loved this program because it wasn't the usual kind of abstinent thing where you, you, know, you talk about disease and that sort of thing. Through the use of stories, poetry, music, and discussion, what this curriculum did was explore with kids who were around ninth grade, middle school, ninth grade, what does it mean to love somebody? in different kinds of love relationships. But I think that's where we've missed the boat. Society has become so hung up on sex education that they've forgotten the deeper thing we should be teaching kids is what it really means to love somebody. The interesting thing about it, this program, they did a controlled study with it. Kids who went through this program, I believe as ninth graders, 92% of them, 92 of them remained abstinent compared to 72% in a control group. So that tells you that there are other strategies that are far more effective, I think, you know, at helping kids. My suspicion about the 8% who do not remain abstinent, we find that a lot of the kids who become involved with sex at an early age are very troubled kids, and they are looking in a sexual relationship to fulfill some other gap, you know, in their life. Early sexual activity is usually a sign that something else is wrong. Mm -hmm. Uh, can you tell me about a little bit more about your book, The Vocation of Love? Who is the audience? Who's the intended the audience is uh, ninth grade kids. Uh, it's, I, most of the work that I do is within the Catholic community in the, at the parish level. 
um, pre-confirmation. And you've spoken to an extraordinary number of kids as well. By the grace of God, about 180,000 kids over the last 27 years. So would you say that the vocational block really grew out of that? Um... It grew out of my experience with discussing these issues with young people. I hope to follow this book with another book on Respect the Life, which will focus specifically um, on the pro-life issue. So I'm hoping to do a number of things, uh, you know, with education. I hope to work with parish communities uh, on, in helping them tackle, you know, this issue. Because I think this is a particularly toxic culture for kids. Mm -hmm. I don't think kids are any happier for being given all of the adult options, so-called, in the sexual arena. I don't think we've helped kids that way. I think we've harmed them um, tremendously. I think we've given these kids very adult things, if you happen to believe in them. They are very adult things, and I think it's been a disaster. How would someone um buy this book if they want to tell what will be available. It's not quite in print, it's in process, but they can contact the Respect Life Education Office of the Archdiocese of Boston. And uh, I hope to visit a lot more parishes, uh, you know, in the, in the coming years and months. And I hope to work with teachers and parents as well. Fantastic. Well, it's been wonderful having this conversation with you, Linda. Oh, it's been and, great. It's been great. And uh, we'd like to have you back on the show. <clears throat> if there was a show. <laughs> Thank you. I'm only sorry I don't have a book to hold up in front of the... I know, that's something that will... <laughs>